A very pleasant afternoon to all our viewers. Dogplexus, in association with Care Institute of Medical Sciences, brings to you this exclusive session where today we are going to discuss about management of infections and difficult fevers of 2021. I am very happy to introduce our speakers for the day. Our first session will be taken by Dr. Vipul Thakkar, where he will be talking about sepsis guidelines and what's new in 2021. Welcome, Dr. Vipul. Please start with your presentation. Sepsis. You all know, you might be knowing sepsis is a medical emergency, though it is very difficult to diagnose many times, right? So what we are going to cover, definition part sepsis 3, which came in 2016, We'll discuss salient important part of surviving sepsis guideline 2016, what was 2018 update, and we'll try to touch upon uh, some of the trial if time permits. Right? So what was our previous understanding about sepsis definition? It was very much objective. Some source of infection, uh, two of the four source criteria you can see on the right side of slide. And what is septic shock? Septic shock was, it's a shock refractory to your fluid resuscitation. This was all. Don't try to remember this, just for uh, differentiation. So what came new in 2016? This definition, sepsis, which is known as sepsis 3, which became a bit more subjective. Uh, it has three component. It is a response to infection. Sepsis is a response to infection. And the response is dysregulated and uncontrolled. And definitely it should have some organ dysfunction, which, is, which carries some threat to life. So sepsis 3 is life-threatening organ dysfunction by dysregulated host response to infection. What is septic shock? Septic shock is subset of sepsis which carries profound circulatory, molecular or metabolic abnormality. It carries mortality in the range of 10 to 40 percent. So when you suspect, when you screen for you, when you think for sepsis, there is quick SOFA scoring system any two or three out of three will prompt you to think for sepsis. Any rise in respiratory rate more than normal, any drop in BP or any alteration in uh, mentation will prompt you to think for sepsis. If QSOFA score is positive, physician, physician should start thinking for sepsis and if you have suspected source of infection, it is very likely diagnosis of sepsis. A uh, mnemonic you can remember brain, breathing and BP. If any abnormality of this, you should think for sepsis with associated infection. Surviving sepsis guideline which came in 2016, which is again considered as a Bible or Bhagavad Gita for those who are resuscitating and managing sepsis part. It has been endorsed and prepared by many of uh, important society across the globe. So what we will discuss some important part of this guideline and what is our new understanding, what is our new thinking by experience and expert, we will discuss try to that part. So sepsis is a medical emergency, it carries a threat to life, How they, what they have recommended is re resuscitation for sepsis related hypoperfusion with at least 30 ml of kg within first 3 hours of presentation to ED, right? Uh, they have included very good part in sepsis guideline, like uh, dynamic measures, dynamic variable of assessment of fluid responsiveness, that is adequacy of fluid resuscitation. They have included dynamic over static. What are static measures for fluid resuscitation? Like CVP. What are dynamic measures? They are like passive leg raising test or response to fluid challenge or heart lung interaction indices like uh, stroke volume variation pulse pressure variation which is totally uh, separate and experts uh, topic altogether other important part they have targeted mean arterial pressure early goal di directed therapy which came in 2001 2002 that included and targeted uh, scvo2 cvp and urine output to be targeted while resuscitating but here they have thrown out that CVP, SCVO2 and urine output. They have targeted mean arterial pressure. We will try to discuss that part. Again, 
they have suggested resuscitation to normalize lactate. Again, this part is debatable. So, uh, what expert and evidence says, there are, they have process, promise and arise trial came in last five to seven years. They have disfavored use of uh, SCVO2 and CVP and uh, early goal directed therapy. But again, expert feels CVP not targeting, which is still okay, because success of uh, assessing fluid adequacy, fluid resusc resuscitation adequacy by CVP is 50%, right? But uh, targeting SCVO2, what is SCVO2? That is oxygen saturation from the blood obtained from central line. What does it indicate? It is a marker of oxygen ox extraction uh, from blood. Any mismatch between supply and demand of oxygen will cause C uh, SCO to be low. If supply is less or demand is much more, then SCVO2 value will be going down. So in previous guideline, it, they were targeting SCVO2, which is saturation of the blood obtained from central line. They were asked to target more than 70. Again, expert believes this needs to be targeted. What about lactate? Normalizing lactate is okay according to a uh, surviving sepsis guideline. Again, this is very debatable because otherwise lactate is considered to be a marker of tissue hypoperfusion. Is a, uh, it rises in case of anaerobic metabolism. But uh, theoretically and conceptually it is believed that even in aerobic glycolysis, like in hyperadrenergic state, like in adrenal, adrenaline infusion, lactate level can go high, even in absence of uh, hypoperfusion. And while interpreting lactate, you need to consider the clearance of lactate, which is uh, uh, it's, uh, removed by liver. So in case of hepatic injury or low hepatic flow, lactate may be high. So you need, need not to target lactate normal, because otherwise it will lead to overzealous, or enthusiastic resuscitation and use of vasopressor, which is again harmful. So, what about initial fluid resuscitation? It should be individualized. In, for an example, in elderly with cardiac uh, dysfunction, 30 ml per kg, that is around 1.5 to 2 liter, which may be very much high volume. Again, in, in uh, young adult with intraabdominal sepsis, that volume and speed may be less, 30 ml per kg. Again, very important is origin of sepsis. You can you cannot resuscitate equal volume in pneumonia patient because where volume may be hazardous compared to intraabdominal sepsis. So again, <clears throat> they have asked to reassess the hemodynamic status within three hours. Again, management and reassessment of hemodynamic status should go hand in hand. It's, you should not wait for three hours uh, bundle or target to reassess hemodynamic status. What they have recommended is uh, appropriate culture from appropriate site before starting early appropriate antibiotic. Uh, again, antibiotic within one hour from both sepsis and septic sh shock group of patient. Again, diagnosis of sepsis is very elusive. So for an example, how sepsis is elusive? Elusive matlab it is brahmak. Barabar, sepsis hoye tiyare dekha hai nahi, ane na hoye tiyare aapne antibiotic thi treat kariye chhi. Barabar, so sepsis is elusive syndrome. In the group of patient who is presented with shock, later on found to be septic shock, were not treated with, uh, uh, considered as sep sepsis. 23% of patient were missed. And many sepsis mimics like pancreatitis, drug fever, been treated with antibiotic and uh, unnecessary resuscitation. Again, treating antibiotic within one hour time frame is a, will lead to overuse of antibiotic and unnecessary use of antibiotic because it all depends on severity of presentation and time course of illness. The time zero, which is a triage time to emergency room, which is uh, not always the same for each given case, right? So this is very important. And uh, trial are showing your delay of antibiotic up to five hours may not increase mortality. And even early antibiotic in form of pre-hospital use of antibiotic has not reduced uh, mortality. 
So again, this is very slight debatable nowadays. Duration of antibiotic, they recommended shorter duration is appropriate. Intra-abdominal abscess, you can, under, I mean, new evidence are supporting intra-abdominal sepsis and abscess. Four days of antibiotic is adequate with adequate source control. Community acquired pneumonia, five days of antibiotic is enough. Nosocomal pneumonia with acute pyelonephritis, I mean, both can be treated with seven days of antibiotic or less. Right? What about vasopressor? Noradrenaline, vasopressin, epinephrine. That sequence is fine. Noradrenaline is uh, vasopressor of choice. If not responding to vasopressor, you need to, you can, you should use F-choline, 200 milligram per day. So what is new? 2018 update has came and they have included all these uh, parameters in one hour. They should be started in one hour. Again, regarding vasopressor, noradrenaline should be started even earlier than one hour. They have recommended because it improves diastolic arterial pressure, thereby improving coronary perfusion, contractility, and it also improves preload. So, uh, this is one hour bundle which is updated in 2018. Again, they have targeted lactate, obtaining blood culture, antibiotics in one hour, same amount of fluid and vasopressor. They have targeted all to be started within one hour. So what is new about vasopressor? Angiotensin 2 is upcoming vasopressor. In ethos, it is released in response to reduction in circulate, effective circulatory volume. It is a potent vasoconstrictor. Aldosterone secretion is triggered. And sodium and water retention is occurring with the response to angiotensin 2. What ethos... Three study about uh, angiot angiotensin 2 says uh, increase in mean arterial pressure and improvement in cardiovascular SOFA score in response to angiotensin 2. It is side effect of exacerbation of LVF and bronchoconstriction. What, what is new about hydrocortisone in septic patient? Large trial by Australian and New Zealand uh, group of uh, intensivist adrenal trial published almost three years back 3,800 patient, they have shown the patient who received hydrocortisone has faster resolution of shock as compared to placebo group. But a continuous infusion of hydrocortisone did not result in 90-day improvement in mortality. Right? So again, role of steroid in septic shock is somewhat debated. What about timing of renal replacement therapy in sepsis, early septic shock? They have compared early strategy versus late strategy. What is early? Within 12 hours of failure stage of rifle uh, classification. What is rifle classification? That is three times rise in creatinine or create more than four or oliguria for 12 hours or anuria for 12 hours. So what they have concluded in septic shock with acute kidney injury, uh, early strategy doesn't lead to improvement in mortality at 90 days. Again, these all trial are appearing negative, but it definitely adds to our information. It will consolidate your um, current existing knowledge. Uh, discussed in previous lecture only, sedation and ventilation. The, this is very new trial uh, published almost one month back, February 2021. 20% uh, 20 of sepsis patient receives mechanical ventilation. The dexmedetomidine versus propofol. Dexmedetomidine is alpha receptor, alpha 2 receptor agonist, and it is believed it has less chances of delirium, better antibacterial and immunomodulatory property, and it has been associated with better sleep. So it has been compared with propofol in men's 2 trial. So what they have concluded, there is no difference in mortality and uh, sedation scores and goals, right? This probably has been discussed by Dr. Bhavin Dalal in previous lecture, X trial, vitamin C, thiamine, sepsis, because of antioxidant and cofactor property in uh, carbohydrate pathway of metabolism, that it has believed to be beneficial because of uh, lack of, I mean, reduced intake and increased demand in sepsis patient but it has not shown to be beneficial. 
So what is important and take home message? Sepsis is a medical emergency. It is quite many times difficult to diagnose. So it's a silent killer. Resuscitative strategy and timing of early antibiotics should be individualized. Limited role of SC, uh, CVP, but there is role of SCVO2. Target dynamic measures of resuscitation. Angiotensin 2 is a new vasopressor may be coming up. And early re renal replacement therapy and steroid has questionable role. And propofol and dexmedetomidin are equally acceptable in sepsis ventilated patient. Thank you, Dr. Vipul. That was a very insightful session. Without further ado, let's move on to our second session for the day, where Dr. Subramaniam Swaminathan will be talking about difficult fevers with a case based approach. Thank you for the invitation to be part of the uh, program. Um, Subramaniam Swaminathan, uh, Director of Infectious Diseases at Clinical Global Hospital in Chennai and Bangalore. So I'll be talking about difficult fever. So how do you evaluate a fever? And I'm going to have it as a case-based um, evaluation. And I wish, uh, you know, physical meetings could be more interactive. A little difficult doing it on a virtual platform, but we'll try it nonetheless. My disclosures I work with everybody equally conflicted. First case is a 59 year old gentleman who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and had primarily perianal disease. Uh, he was already on azathioprine and steroids, and he'd had a history of multiple uh, fistula surgeries done. And in spite of it, he kept having recurrent disease. And uh, the GI team felt that uh, azathioprine and steroids were just not cutting it. So he was being evaluated for the use of infliximab. And as part of the pre-treatment evaluation, he had uh, evaluation of his serology. So his hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HCV and HIV were negative. The quantiferon gold test was negative. A PPD was also performed, which was negative. A chest X-ray was done, was completely normal. At which time he was counseled about infliximab and he was started on infliximab. So he got the first two doses without any problems. Third dose he received in uh, June, uh, May of 2015. So this is about six years ago. So he developed high-grade fever and dry gas and perianal pain a week later, meaning he was fine at the time of the first dose, the second dose. About uh, a week after the third dose, he develops high-grade fever, rigors, and perianal pain. He was admitted in ICU because he appeared septic and he was started on meropen. A CT scan was done, which showed an intersphincteric perianal abscess. And remember, he's had multiple uh, fistulas in that area, all of which have been medically managed and whatnot. Because he developed a large abscess, it had to be incised and drained, which was done uh, under uh, in uh, theater. So the question was, what was this? Was it tuberculosis? Because you know, when we talk about uh, uh, use of uh, uh, these kind of designer drugs, tuberculosis risk always becomes an important thing. Is it an amoeboma? Is it pyogenic abscess? Is it lymphoma? Or is it just poorly controlled Crohn's that the infliximab is just not cutting it? So at this point, uh, a lot of tests were done. I don't think we have the option of asking the audience what they think. So let's look at TNF alpha blockers. Obviously, these are the class of drugs which have been used the maximum among the, amongst the biologics. Possibly, rituximab is the next uh, most most commonly used drug. And obviously, the common risk issues that we see with this are tuberculosis, lymphoma, uh, viral hepatitis, which can flare. So, Hep B, Hep C syndrome is always something that we look at. Lupus-like syndrome, demyelination, congestive heart failure, and also let's not forget things like endemic mycosis reactivation and things like that. So the, for this patient, we had a look at the smear and what happened in, uh, uh, in the labs, both in pathology and microbiology. Histopathology said there was severe subacute inflammation uh, with ill-defined granulomas and a lot of AFP. And the gene expert was positive for MTB. So this patient's uh, cell-mediated immunity was so bad that he actually re uh, reacted to uh, a very overabundant TB, uh, like a pyogenic uh, inflammation. And so much so that this was a... Uh, like a mycobacterial hot abscess. Generally, TB causes cold abscess. This is a mycobacterial hot abscess, which can be seen in patients who are extremely CMI depleted. And uh, he was started in ATT and he did well, although the story goes on to a longer story in the uh, back end. And I don't think we have the time to do it uh, today. But having said that, this is an important point. Yes, uh, the presentation of a disease depends on the patient. And if the patient has specific problems with their immune system, which can be congenital or acquired, then the way a disease manifests is very, very different. 
So when we are looking at an evaluation of a patient, always keep these things in mind. So in this patient, the abscess could have been because of a new fistula that happened, but then on inflix for it to happen is most unusual. It could have been a biogenic cause, that's always possible, but then if you did have a fistula and all of it was healed, why should you suddenly develop a biogenic fistula? And uh, uh, tuberculosis is something that needs to be considered even though the person comes in with an acute presentation or what looked like an acute presentation with high-grade fever and an abscess-like situation. So it's important to understand that uh, uh, the presentation of a known disease as a known complication can be modified uh, to a very unusual or a less common presentation depending on the host immune system. So let's look at the second case. A 47 year old gentleman from Andhra Pradesh, he was a known diabetic for many years, very poorly controlled, his sugars were all over the place. He said he was unwell for nearly two months. He had uh, hemoptysis, he had weight loss, he had some fever spikes. Uh, he reported saying that he had history of pulmonary TB in the past, which had been treated. And he had, had a CT scan of the chest done outside. It showed a left upper lobe cavity. So he had a sputum smear done for AFP. It was negative. A gene expert was not performed. AFP cultures were not done. He was empirically started on ATT saying, listen, he's a diabetic. He's got left, left upper lobe cavity. He's got fever, hemoptysis, and weight loss. You know, he fits into the classical presentation of a, a tuberculous cavitating disease. So at this point, he decided to come to our hospital uh, to figure out what's happening. So bronchoscopy was also performed. The AFP smear was negative. Aerobic culture just showed normal flora. The gene expert was negative. So because his upper lobe was looking pretty rotten, the surgical team was consulted. They came and had a look and they said uh, the upper lobe is non salvageable. And so he underwent a left upper lobe lobectomy and uh, the antitubercular therapy was continued. And operative findings, it was, uh, it was a nightmare in theater. The whole thing was adherent to the chest wall. Uh, it was there were adhesions in the apex and there was a lot of consolidation in the left upper lobe. So basically the whole upper lobe was necrotic and consolidated and cavitated and stuck. It was basically one god awful mess. And the surgeon was considered wondering how come this is not TB. So more tests were done, operatives, uh, they got tissues and uh, uh, you know all those fluids and whatnot uh, sent off. And there was no AFB seen in any of this. There was no fungal ailment seen because they were wondering could this be fungus. Smear for no cardia again, not effect in you know that negative. Uh, gram stain shows many pus cells, but no organisms. So the question was, what the hell was happening? At this point, uh, the ID team was called and saying, okay, well, why is this patient's TB looking so bad and what is happening? So the histopathology was looked at. So a lot of stuff there. So what I would like to focus upon is that there is granulomatous inflammation that you can see. Granulomatous inflammation in the adjacent lung parenchyma and the resection margin. And there is some fibrosis and some alveolar da damage. And so it was considered uh, the final diagnosis left upper lobe of the lung, granulomatous inflammation with large ages of necrotizing and suppurative inflammation involving the cavity and bronchial resection margin. See, the problem is most people, when they have a look at this, they'll immediately say, oh my God, granulomatous inflammation with necrosis and all that. So therefore it is TB. Not every granuloma is TB. So the question was, what was happening? If there was TB, why were we not able to identify the TB? Is it because he's already had treatment? If so, why is he worsening? A lot of questions. So the question is, is this drug susceptible TB or are we dealing with the case of multi-drug resistant TB? Is it a fungal infection? Is it nocardia? Is it some other bacterial infection? Or, you know, or maybe is this cancer actually? Is this some kind of lung cancer which is behaving very weird? All of this would be possibilities and we'd have to look at all of this. And this is where we need to talk to the microbiologists. We need to talk to the pathologists. We need to perform a lot more tests to try and figure out what's happening. So we got uh, aerobic culture done and aerobic culture was initially reported as a non-fermenting gram negative bacilli. And as you can look at it, it's susceptible to quite a few things, but it's resistant to aminoglycosides, resistant to cipro, resistant to colistin, jetamycin, uh, tigicyclin. So some, some and uh, the carbapenem susceptible, the third gen cephalosporin susceptible. So it's a non-fermenter. It's a weird so What could this be? Is this uh, you know, it's a rotten lung, so maybe it's just a colonizer. Is that the problem? So there was questions about it. We felt uh, we already had a clue as to what the diagnosis was going to be, so we decided to go down the rabbit hole to identify what it was. So we sent it off for a multi top. Now, of course, the current uh, automated systems are good enough to identify filiatosis, but uh, about six years ago, when this patient came, it was six, seven years ago, uh, systems did not have milliard in their panel. And Maldetoff actually confirmed that this was actually 
buckled area pseudomalia. And the final diagnosis was pulmonary milioidosis, which can mimic TB like picture. Milioidosis, again, there are multiple forms. There is the, the granulomatous form, the septicemic form, and the pulmonary form, and things like that. And this is pulmonary milioidosis. He was, start, he was started on IV septazerim and was sent home on the same, and he was doing very well. Of course, his story was also long and complicated with the formation of chest wall abscesses requiring the rib resection and relapse of the, the milioidosis and things like that, but that's for another day. But the point here is, be careful about what you read from radiology pathology. Why? I don't think radiologists or pathologists should be giving etiological diagnosis unless they see the organism. For example, I know a lot of radiologists report uh, granulomas on the lung or on the liver and things like that. Granulomas are things that we see under a microscope. You do not see granulomas on the lung or the liver for that matter. Finding a cavity does not mean much. A lot of things can cause cavities and a lot of it is not TB. So be very careful. So, uh, and again, pathology, you got to be careful. Just because you find necrotized and granulomatous information doesn't make it TB. So as a matter of policy, our pathologists here are very careful. Even if they feel it's very much like TB, they always say, yada, 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 whatever, whatever, whatever. Consistent with the possibility of tuberculosis, please correlate clinically and with other studies like AFP culture and the expert report. That's the sensible way of doing it because you really don't want to get into trouble thinking, oh my God, he has definitely seen the TB germ and that's why he's reporting it. You can't see it. You can't make out what is what. You can only say it is looking like this. Now, whether it is consistent or not is a clinical call. It has to be correlated with many other features, so including the predisposed probability that this could be TB. So don't make uh, too much of a leap of faith because that could end very badly. So this patient had pulmonary milioidosis. And it's important to know this because it's a multi-system disease from a soil-based organism. It is common in tropical countries everywhere. Uh, in the southern half of the country, we see a lot of milioidosis. And uh, it can present as visceral abscesses. And it has a tendency to form uh, granulomas. Uh, the septicemic forms have very high mortality. The treatment is IV septazidine or meropenem. For the sick of patient, we use meropenem. For the not so sick patient, we use septazidine. And for follow-up, we generally use photoremoxol, sometimes with doxycycline, but most of the times photoremoxol as singleton therapy is probably good enough. The next case uh, is a 57-year-old gentleman who's a, who was in the IRS a revenue service, and he was diabetic for five years on insulin. This was, again, just before the Chennai class of 2015. He was admitted with fever and dry dust of five days duration. He was admitted in another hospital, and he was on multiple antibiotics, and in spite of it, he was not getting better. Because he was starting to develop jaundice, they got, they got a little panicky and they decided to shift him to our hospital. And there was also this concern of liver failure and the patient was admitted into the liver team. So the, my team was called in and we decided to have a look at the patient to see what was happening. And we decided always go back to the history. The history was he said he had been diagnosed to have end of thalmitis of the left eye in March. So that was about six, seven months prior to presentation. And he was admitted at a major hospital in another state. And uh, the pus was aspirated from the eye and it was reported as methicillin susceptible staph aureus. He had an enucleation and he subsequently received linezolid. And as per his own words, almost the whole hospital came and saw him because they were wondering what was happening. But unfortunately, nobody really put any more thought into it to figure out what was happening. And since he got better on that, they decided to leave him be. And he was reasonably well after that. Problem was, even after he got better, he just did not gain back the weight that he had lost. And he had episodes of fever off and on for the next six months. And he was diagnosed to have UTI. And twice the urine culture grew staph aureus. And each time he was treated the linens are in successfully. And this is basically what has happened before this. And now he's down with a significant fever and he was looking a little sick. He was a thinly built gentleman. He seemed a little confused. He was slightly angry. The vital was stable, but he was definitely tachycardic. There was no rash. The heart sounds seemed normal. There was no additional sounds to nervous, no obvious neurological deficits. And we got ophthalmology to have a look at the intact eye. And they said there are changes in that eye as well. So lab showed uh, elevated counts with a shift to the left. The bilirubin was elevated. The transaminases showed mild elevation. Prothrombin time was normal. Creatinine was 2.2 milligram percent. Blood and urine culture was sent and started on meropenem. Urine analysis subsequently came back with some abnormalities as well. So at this point, he had already been on meropenem when uh, my team was called in. So what do we do? Do we continue meropenem? Do we add vancomycin? Do we switch to sulfate? Do we add quarter or should we just put him on flufloxacillin? 
So always remember that go back to the history. This is a gentleman who has had a recurrent staff, and therefore you'll have to worry about staff. All three blood cultures, which were set at that time, was start grew methicillin like susceptible staff. Or yes, he was started on cefazolin, and about three, three days, four, three, four days later, his blood culture is clear. He was put on six weeks of cefazolin. We treated him as a probable endocarditis, and his eye made a full recovery. And this time he gained his weight and uh, regained, went back to his original baseline weight. And uh, again, two years, it's now five years. And I just heard back from him because he said he's going to go for his COVID, COVID vaccination. And he is doing spectacularly well, which is really, really heartening. He's a very, very intelligent and very smart gentleman and a very pleasant person. And I'm very happy to see that he's doing well. But this is a case where we have a lot of truths that we learn about staph aureus. In staff, always do blood touches. Be very generous about doing blood touches. Whenever you see staff somewhere, I'm not talking about skin and soft tissue infections. Other than that, anywhere you, you, you find staff inside the body, do a blood culture because bacteria in staff areas is handled very, very differently. If you have staff in the blood, always repeat blood cultures to see when you're clearing it. Because the longer the duration of staff in the blood, the more likely you are to have intercarditis and the more likely you are to seed somewhere and cause a secondary metastatic infection. And remember, if you have MSSA, vancomycin and linezolid are not the best drugs. Drugs like cefazolin or fluproxacillin are clearly superior. They have a survival benefit in that less people die on cefazolin and fluproxacillin, more people die on vancomycin and linezolid if you have MSSA. Finally, remember that staph in the urine means you have to consider staph in the blood. Remember, urinary tract infection is ascending infection for gram negatives. But for staph, it is hematogenous spreading. So if you get of staph pyelonephritis and urinary tract infection, that came through the bloodstream. So this patient already had multiple blood cultures that were positive based on the fact that he had urine staph with pyelonephritis. Therefore, this patient has had recurrent staph or his bacteremia, which means there's an indwelling source. And uh, at least one st study seems to suggest that, actually more than one study has suggested that whenever you have staph or his, getting your infection disease fully improves survival. So ask for help because that way you will know what the goals of care are and how to evaluate correctly so that you are less likely to make mistakes and definitely improve survival of your patient, which is what we all want. So the last patient that I have is a 32-year-old gentleman who presented a fever for the last four days. He has body aches and fatigue and severe nausea. He had a slight rash. Um, he had history of chicken pox as a childhood, in childhood. Uh, he says he reported, uh, he returned from a uh, trip to Thailand about 15 days ago. He was diving in the sea, he ate some raw seafood, and he also had unprotected sex. On examination, he has a tachycardia, and his blood pressure is 95 by 70. He's otherwise a very healthy guy. So the question is, what is this? So the question is, could this be leptospira, could this be acute seroconverting illness, syphilis, dengue, malaria, influenza, scrub typhus, or typhoid? So as you can see, there's language in here which could possibly tell you any number of things or possibly even more. But you always go back to epidemiology to find out what are the common things that happen. So this was dengue. Remember, he had fever and body pains. And a tonicate test was advised, but it's not a great test. Again, you want to do a dengue serology, do a hemogram. And the treatment of dengue is about the therapy. Give fluids, fluids, fluids. If you can take orally, that's fine. Platelet is not something we routinely use. Do not give iron injections at NSAIDs. And there's no role for steroids and definitely no role for antibiotics. But the point here is epidemiology is important. If somebody is traveling somewhere, somebody's done something, always look at the risk factors which come in because of that activity and look at what are the possible uh, fallout of that. It may be infectious, it may be non infectious. Obviously, uh, exposure related infections are a big issue and it only comes in with an understanding of the epidemiology. So, if somebody will go, go somewhere. Look up and find out what are the common problems in that place. And is this consistent with what that could be? So if you look at Southeast Asia, right now for a returning travel in the US, the number one cause of a returning of fever and returning travel is actually not malaria, it's actually dengue. So keep that in mind. I know that here the incubation period is a little long. Maybe the dengue was actually something he picked up locally, but anything is possible. So please be aware of that. Please understand the importance of asking a very good history. So whenever you have a difficult fever, the best uh, weapon in your armamentarium is a very good history and a systematic evaluation and a syndromic approach. Understand the exposures, know your patient's baseline, know the syndrome that you're having and go step by step and you can't go wrong. 99% of the time, you'll be able to figure it out. 
85% of the diagnosis comes, comes from history and the story is always very, very important. Thank you and all the best for the rest of the program. Thank you, Dr. Subramaniam for your session. This brings us to our last session for the day, which will be taken by Dr. Savaj, who will be talking about difficult tropical infections. My talk is generally tropical infections. And the tropical infections, they are always challenging because they change their presentation. Uh, new and new uh, tropical infections are coming. And uh, so let's go back to history. I am from Surat, so I describe about the plague. In 1994, there was a plague outbreak and the epicenter was Surat. And if you want to learn uh, tropical infections, please do come to Surat and you you will see wide varieties of uh, tropical infections in Surat. Meliodosis was quite new to Gujarat because till now the cases of meliodosis were reported from South India. We recently reported a case of, case of meliodosis from Gujarat and it was a first case. And after that, we had a series of uh, cases of meliodosis from uh, Gujarat. Recently, Dr. Atul Patel sir has also seen many cases of meliodosis and with the help of Sir Vedu published in one of the microbiology journal regarding our observation of nephromycosis in Gujarat. Uh, we, uh, we have noticed the, there is a relation of food with uh, many infections and uh, Surti people, they love uh, delicious food. So we have aluduri, we have coco and we have locho. And I'll show you uh, one, I'll show one case related to food also. So without wasting time, let's go to case. And I'll try to uh, finish my presentation uh, uh, fast. So case one is a young male patient, 23 years from Nausari. So basically Nausari is quite near to Surat, part of South Gujarat. So he is an engineering student, no uh, significant class history. He presented with fever and abdominal distension of one month. He took multiple course of antibiotic. Uh, multiple CBC show leukocytosis and on US there were multiple cystic lesion in the liver and spleen. He came to Surat with progressive fever and progressive abdominal distension. When he came to Surat, he was already in shock. He was taken into ICU, uh, relevant blood investigations were taken. You can see that he, his hemoglobin is low, he had a leukocytosis, also thrombocytopenia. And uh, on peripheral smear examination, 12% atypical lymphocytes were seen. And pathologists commented, try to rule out infectious mononucleosis. And uh, creatinine was 0.4. Blood cultures were negative. His LFT was quite altered, high BD, even enzymes were elevated, altered INR. He was started on antibiotic, but despite the present tazobectum, continued with the high grade fever. So going back to history, there were multiple animals at uh, home. So like they had one buffalo, one cow, and the cat was playing in the garden. So he was bathing buffalo, was milking cow, and he was feeding cat and playing with the cat. And there was also history of drinking unpasteurized uh, cow milk. CT was done, and you can see quite. Uh, cystic lesion in the liver and spleen and entire liver and spleen is flooded with this cystic uh, lesion and they reported as a paleosis hepatis. Now paleosis, paleosis hepatis, this term is quite common to gastro, uh, gastroenterologists and it's a vascular uh, condition, it's a benign vascular condition where there is a dilatation of the sinusoidal blood filled space within the liver and it causes cystic lesion. It's Cysts were aspirated, 10 ml fluid came, which was hemorrhagic. Uh, bacterial culture gene expert uh, were negative. Nothing was seen on the smear. Blood culture was negative, ubico normal, brucella negative, BFP antigen negative, bone marrow examination was also normal. So we don't have any diagnosis. Empirically, we have started processing in the After, after this day, uh, we were discussing that we 
that the people need to lay in and this kind of type of treatment can be just. I hope you have enjoyed my presentation. It was uh, a try to get it a small and big. And uh, if I could not cover a few points and if there is any way, you can directly watch up in this video. And thank you so much. Once again, thanks to all our speakers. I'm sure your session has helped a lot of our audience to take away some good insights from it. And to all our viewers out there, thank you so much for taking our time and coming and attending the lectures. Please stay tuned for more such insights. Till then, stay safe, stay connected. Happy dog flexing.